everything, and there's no sense of it ever ending. So when it finally stops, you just can't even believe that you're back to who you were before. Like what happened to Jodie Foster. Exactly what happens to Jodie Foster in Contact. So. Is that, is that the moment of no time then? That's the zero time, yeah. And Daniel doesn't agree with me on this, but I believe that 2012 is our zero time reference. By the way, Daniel did say that the stargates are real, that there is one main stargate per planet, that they dug them up from ancient Atlantean technology. They actually buried it under the ice in Antarctica because they were concerned that something would come through that could damage human life. So that is real. Stargate SG-1, all those television shows of which there's 10 seasons, the first and second year of Stargate SG-1 are remarkably loaded with real stuff. And there's even an episode of Stargate called Wormhole Extreme, and you remember that one? Where they're making a fake television show about a real Stargate program. It's like this inside tongue-in-cheek joke. And everybody watching the show kind of knows, okay, they're telling us something here. There's something real behind all this stuff. Well, it's true. Why do they do that? Okay, that's a very good point. Um, the reason why they do that is that you hide the truth out in the open so that if I go, go into this lecture and I'm telling you all this stuff, you can just say, oh, well, he's just, he's just into Stargate. You know, he's just watching television shows. But if, in fact, this was really cool. One time um, I was sitting down with Daniel one day, and we're talking about the looking glass. And this has a little uh, orb that appears when you're looking at a particular place, and it's a ball of light. So they gave it this really weird name. They call it an outer band individuated teletracer. Okay? Outer band individuated teletracer. And they shortened it to the word obit. Outer band individuated teletracer, an obit, right? So then we're thinking, all right, this is what they always do, right? They hide this shit out in the open. Let's go Google outer band individuated teletracer and see if there's anything there. I couldn't believe it when we went on Google after he just told me this. He had no idea either. And boom, Outer Limits. There's an episode of The Outer Limits called Outer Band Individuated Teletracer. Wow. And it's all about this stuff. There was a show, he, he was actually really interested in me too because I seem to have some sort of psychic connection to, this, to these things. He says, he says to me one day, what do you think a TVG is? I said, time vector generator. How did you know that? You're right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I did not go to Montauk. I've never sat in the chair. Somebody asked me that. Did you, were you in the chair? No, no, no. I was just very, very fortunate by some kind of crazy synchronicity to meet this guy. I wish he would go forward, but he doesn't want to. He did tell me, by the way, that they have found life on other planets. He said that the moon Io around Jupiter has little creatures crawling in the, in the rocks. He said that Mars once had a civilization, that they've actually had astronauts on Mars, that they have a photograph that he saw of these astronauts waving with a big pyramid next to them. They actually have underground bases on Mars. There's a technology we've learned about from other witnesses now called a jump room, where you walk into the room, it's like an elevator, the doors close, <laughs> you suddenly feel really sick to your stomach, the doors open, and boom, you're on Mars, just like that. No time has elapsed. So these technologies already exist. And I would certainly like to have one. It would be a lot easier than taking an airplane flight. <laughs> you can get over the stomach thing, I guess. So, you know, again, all, all gate travel is much better than using a, using a ship. It's a much pref preferable method um, than, than traveling by a spaceship uh, because you go a lot faster and you go a lot farther. And you can reverse engineer it by taking the seat out of the ship, which is what they're doing here. So, have these seats ever showed up in film so that they can hide it out in the open? <laughs> well, check this out. There's your seat. Now, this one doesn't actually have any consciousness interface, but some of the other ones do. Total recall. Jump rooms to Mars, civilization on Mars, underground city, pyramid at the end. And once again, you have a chair that has a strong effect on your consciousness. In Stargate SG-1, they have the chair of the ancients, and O'Neill sits in it, and it activates and, and amplifies his consciousness, which allows him to def defeat the evil fleet of the Gua'uld by shooting balls of light at them. Minority report. Here you have people sitting in chairs, floating in water, 
and they are psychic, and it is amplifying their psychic ability, which Tom Cruise is then able to manipulate on a screen. One of the things that Daniel told me is that out of all the waves that this chair cranks out from the ships, that it also includes visual images from your pineal gland. And they can space them out and look at them, just like in the movie. So this may have been designed to set the precedent so that someday they could actually create a department of pre-crime. Now what also is very interesting is that the witness testimony we have of people going through these wormholes shows us that it looks like little light bulbs lined along the sides as you go inside. So that right there is not an accident. We've already got pre-crime in Britain. Really? Jim Mars has been talking about it. Oh, how about that? Jim Mars has been talking about pre-crime in Britain, he said. Okay, X-Men is another one. You remember Cerebro, where he wheels up to this thing? This is actually the antenna at Montauk, except that it's an it's a octahedron, two Egyptian pyramids, base to base. But it's the same basic idea. There's a chair in there. You put this little helmet on. This is where you sit. And then it amplifies your psychic ability. That's what allows him to be able to find the missing mutants when they go missing. It's what allows them... You remember that one scene in, uh, in, in X-Men where... Um, one of the whole movies, actually, the plot is that there's an e that there's an evil force that's going to harness his consciousness to get him to run the chair and basically kill everybody who's a mutant on the planet with the psychic amplification. So this is all based on this real technology. Uh, now here's what was strange: this 20-year loop has a bad side effect. When the Philadelphia experiment happened 20 years ago. There was an enormous amount of energy released. That energy reflected through the time domain. It got stuck in the time domain. An enormous, almost a nuclear release of energy was caused in the Philadelphia experiment or the Rainbow Project in 1943. There's a 20-year harmonic, and during certain favorable points in the harmonic, if you have a huge energy release, you're going to get another one down here, and you have a conduit or a gateway between those two areas. Okay? This is bad. We don't like this. This is called a rift. It's very dangerous. It's very serious. 1943 created a rift 40 years later with 1983, I guess somewhere around here. And um, 1983 was when a, a creature got through... August 13th, 1983, and trashed the entire base and destroyed the Montauk base, destroyed the chair. It just so happens that Daniel called in sick and wasn't at work that day. So he didn't get mind wiped, so they didn't erase the memories out of his mind. So he remembers everything that he learned and everything that happened when he was working on this base. Somebody has a question. I just heard it in my head. What kind of creature? Um... The creature was based on the movie Forbidden Planet, which was the monster from the id. The secret that, that Daniel knows, because he was in contact with the guy running the chair, Duncan Cameron, is that they were very pissed off at these Nazis. They did not like the Nazis. They didn't like what they were doing. They thought they had too much power. They thought the potential to misuse this technology was much too vast. And they said, we need to figure out how to stop this thing from going on. They created the monster with their own thought. The official view is that it's a rift and that some interdimensional monster came through. The reality is they took advantage of the 20-year harmonic, which they knew would have that energy, and they used it to create that monster to kill the program, and it worked. So that's the truth. What's that? They would be the, uh, what you would call in the Stargate SG-1, the Tok'ra, the inside people who are not going along with their bosses, but they're rebelling, the white hats, so to speak. So, hold on real quick, I'm losing track of everyone. So Daniel is the burly guy you met, not Dr. Dan Burrish. That's Daniel is the burly guy that I met. He named himself after Daniel in the Stargate series, Daniel Jackson. Is he okay? Are you sure he's okay? I mean, I'm sure that he's okay now. <laughs> Um, he's, he's in seclusion. I haven't even seen him in two years. Um, he usually lives out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he doesn't like a lot of uh, human contact because he's been psychically trained. He was measured as a P7. He had a special psychic gift called a conduit, which allowed him to feel other people's emotions and thoughts very, very strongly. And as a conduit, he was able to take, like in, did everybody see the movie Powder? 
He could do just that. In fact, it's possible because they, he was the only